Secretary General of uh, uh, the uh, of uh, City University of New York. Uh, he's currently the director of the Center for Algorithms and Interactive Scientific Software uh, at sorry City uh, yeah at City College. And um, well, I mean, he needs no introduction from me, um, but maybe. Uh, uh, I can say he puts the G in GGPR, which we have all benefited greatly from. So I really look forward to uh, his keynote address, which we will enjoy now. All right, thank you, Riyad. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. And um, uh, if you guys have hoped for me to talk about SNARK, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I chose a different topic for um, for this keynote, and let me uh, see if I can share my screen. Okay. And at this point, you should be able to see my talk. Right. Okay. So, oops. So instead of talking about snarks, I'm going to talk about. Um, deniable communications and how the simulation paradigm that we all are familiar with in uh, for zero knowledge fits into this and toward the end of the talk i'll tell you why i chose to present this here because it has something to do with standards and it has something to do with how we choose protocols that we want to wide uh, widespread adoption so Here's the talk outline. The talk is divided basically in two parts. The first part is going to be a survey of the notion of deniable or off the record communication. I will talk about some classic results like the deniable authentication notion that came out of the normalability cryptography paper by Dolab, Dwork, and Naur. And then I'll talk about how deniability and simulation uh, are. Uh, interact with each other. That's a, a paper by Rafael Paz. And I'll talk a little bit about an old paper of mine with Hugo Krachik and Mario Di Raimondo about what it means to have a deniable authenticated key exchange. After that, I will talk about some new results on the deniability of current internet messaging applications, in particular, uh, Signal. And this is new work in cooperation with two of my doctoral students, Nihal Batandas and Bertrand Etherburn and Hugo Krachik. All right, so let's jump into it. Uh, deniable communication is when two parties want to communicate in a way that they can authenticate each other. So Bob and Alice know that they're talking to Bob and Alice, but they should not be able to prove that to a third party. Um, so there, if Bob later go to a judge and say, look, I talked to Alice, the judge shouldn't really be able to ascertain that. So, um, you try to make this bar bottom disappear, but for some reason it doesn't want to disappear. So anyway, um, if two parties hold secret keys, if we're in the symmetric cryptography world, this is actually pretty straightforward. If Alice and Bob authenticate their messages with message authentication codes uh, using a shared key, there is no way for Bob to prove that uh, he talked to Alice because when he goes to the judge and said, look, Alice sent me this message and see she authenticated it with this tag, the tag, the judge can say, look, you have the same key. I don't believe you. This is a conversation that you just made up and Alice was never involved. The story dramatically changes when you go into a public key, an asymmetric setting, uh, because now the tag could be a digital signature, for example, that only Alice can compute because she has a matching secret key to a public key. And now, uh, you know, if she digitally signed this message, then this message is not repudiable. That's actually a very important property of digital signatures if you're signing contracts or something that you have to be bound to. But in, the in terms of a private off the record communication, it's a total. Uh, it's a total, total, total killer. Uh, let me see if there is a way that I can remove this bar. Give me a second. Okay. Anyway. So, so how do we define the novel communication? Um, 
informally we say that the messages that Alice and Bob exchange should be able to should at the end Bob knows that those messages uh, come from Alice. There is a way for Alice to prove her identity to Bob, but only to Bob. And that means that what Bob sees in this conversation could have been produced by, by himself. And let me give you an example. This is the classic example that goes back to the, this paper by Dolet Dwork and Orr. Uh, here's how we could do it. Bob um, encrypts a random nonce, a key K, under Alice's public key, sends it to Alice, and Alice then sends back this message that she wants to send with Bob and she authenticated using a message authentication code using this random key that Bob sent to her. Now Bob knows that this comes from Alice because Alice is the only person who can decrypt this. And, but if, she, if he goes to the judge, um, uh, the judge will not be convinced because you know, this entire transcript could have been computed by Bob by himself. He said, you encrypt this on your own and you respond to this encryption by yourself because you also know K. And we'll go back to this, you also know K point in a minute. Um, one thing that was discussed in the original paper by DDN is that for this to be a secure authentication scheme, meaning Alice only, Alice cannot be impersonated, you need to assume that this encryption is secure against chosen cybertext attack because Alice is acting here as a, as a decryption oracle. So you need to make sure that uh, your encryption scheme is robust enough to um, sustain that, that kind of attack. Okay, so remember this informal definition, what Bob sees could have been produced by himself. Well, you probably already started to realize what that means in formal terms. So here's a transcript between Alice and Bob. Well, what do we want? We want that then when this transcript is presented to a judge, this transcript should be indistinguishable from a transcript created by a simulator who knows Alice's public key but does not know Alice's secret key. So if this transcript and this transcript are computationally or in any way indistinguishable, then uh, the judge will not be able to detect if this was a real conversation with Alice or a conversation that Bob made on his own by running the simulator. Well, we know this. This is a conference about zero knowledge proof. So we know that this is uh, exactly, almost exactly what we define zero knowledge. Anything that Bob would have seen in talking to Alice when a certain statement is in a language and Alice has a witness uh, should be computationally indistinguishable from a transcript that Bob has with a simulation in, would input the statement but not the witness. So, um, so it seems very, very similar. Um, and we know that zero knowledge is a very powerful uh, tool um, so in particular, any MP problem can be proven in zero knowledge. And let me briefly be, be patient with me because I'm going to go for the classic three-colorability example, even if I'm sure all of you already know. So here is how Alice convinces Bob that a graph is three-colorable. She takes the coloring of the graph, she randomly it, puts it into envelopes and sends it to Bob. Bob's asked for, for an edge. and Alice opens these commitments and shows that the colors are different. And Bob accepts those two colors are different. Um, what does it work? Well, if the graph is not recolorable, there'll be at least one edge that will have the same color, and that's probability one of an M, where M is the uh, number of edges that Bob will catch Alice if he asks for a random edge, right? And we can make this smaller by repetition. And Intuitively, this is zero knowledge because Bob only sees an edge with two different random colors. Alice permutes the colors at every repetition. This doesn't allow Bob to learn at the recoloring of the graph. We make this formal by uh, creating a simulation. So the simulator doesn't know the three coloring, so it's going to commit to a bunch of random edges, uh, random coloring on each node, right? Bob asks for a random edge. Uh, 
Well, there is an edge that's badly colored, at least an edge that is badly colored because the simulator doesn't know that it's coloring. What happens if Bob asks exactly that wrong edge, right? Here, the simulation is stuck uh, because he doesn't have the coloring of the graph. So we have two standard simulation techniques to deal with this problem. The first one is rewinding. The simulator brings Bob back two steps, changes the committed values. And now on that edge that Bob is going to ask, there are two different colors. Okay, so this is one standard simulation technique. We rewind Bob, change, you know, erase his memory and make sure that everything looks good. The other semi classic simulation technique is to assume that we're implementing this commitment via random oracle, and the simulator is allowed to program this random oracle. And therefore, um, when, I, when Bob says open these two edges, the simulator says, well, you know, really the random oracle on this CI prime gives you this, and the random oracle on the CJ prime gives you this, and those are two different colors. So when I was in grad school and I learned about zero knowledge, uh, I didn't see this, I saw the rewinding. And my first question was, isn't that cheating? And the short answer is, in my mind, is still yes. But the long answer is that it's, 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 it's an okay cheating because it still proves that, learns, that Bob learns nothing. And why is that? You can think of the simulator as a thought experiment. We can set up a world where this conversation between Alice and Bob can be simulated without knowing any of the secrets of Alice. For example, we can set up a world where, where the random oracle really behaves in a way that helps the simulator. Therefore, the transcript itself in this random world contains no information about the secrets. And our judge lives in this world that we're setting up in this thought experiment. The problem is that this other world is not the world that we live in when it comes to deniability. Um, you see, in, 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 in a, the deniability as the simulation has to hold in the real world where, uh, where the conversation is taking place. So in particular, if the two transcripts uh, look different, the judge will be convinced that Bob spoke to Alice, even if there is a different planet in which these two transcripts could be looking could be looking indistinguishable. And there is another judge that says, well, you know, if we programmed the random oracle this way, the transcript would have been indistinguishable. Uh, or if we created certain parameters uh, in certain ways, I could create a simulator that, uh, in which the, the, the two transcripts be distinguishable. This was a very important paper by Rafael Paz in 2003 which really fleshed out the differences between a zero knowledge simulation and a deniability simulation. A deniability simulation must work in the real world. So, and what does that mean? Does that mean the simulation must be straight line. You cannot allow rewinding. And because in reality, you can go and erase people's memory. Once I put something on the line, I have to answer for, those, uh, for that information that I put on the line. Another, another formal explanation consequence of the working in the real world means that common parameters, a common reference string, for example, or the random oracle are passed to the simulator and to the judge as input. Not, the simulator is not allowed to choose them. Therefore, it's not allowed to program a random oracle or a common reference string. So you have to create a simulator that works under these constraints if you want to claim deniability. This is a very strong notion, and it requires strong assumptions to be efficiently realized. Let me show you an example of a strong assumption. Let's go back to our encryption-based authentication. So remember how it works. Bob sends a random nonce to Alice. Alice decrypts it, and then she authenticates the message with that key that Bob sent. Okay, how are we gonna simulate it? Bob sends the ciphertext. The simulation doesn't know the secret key, 
cannot decrypt, how's it gonna answer? Well, what we're going to assume is that the encryption is plain text aware. What is this notion of plain text awareness? Is that if you create a valid ciphertext, you must know already the corresponding plain text. It's a stronger notion that chosen ciphertext attacks security. It really requires the sender to know what's being sent. Um, this is defined formally by assuming that there is an extractor that when Bob outputs a ciphertext, the extractor outputs the corresponding plain text. And I'm uh, drawing the extractor as an open box because this is exactly, it's a non-black box assumption. We're opening Bob's brain. We're looking inside of Bob's brain and we're gonna find that value K that he encrypted. So if we make this assumption, and remember the simulator is, is basically Bob's alter ego. We're proving that Bob could have done this by himself. Then the simulator is allowed to open, to look inside Bob's brain. If we're assuming plain text and awareness, inside Bob's brain, there is this box with K inside. The simulator grabs K and is able to complete the simulation, okay? And this was in my 2006 paper with Mario Di Ramondo and Hugo Kraczyk. That's where we said, if you want to simulate uh, the encryption-based authentication, you have to use plain text awareness. All right, so this pretty much ends the, almost the first part of the talk. Um, and, but in reality, um, two parties, when two parties want to communicate, they actually have a communication session and communication sessions are usually um, structured uh, in two parts. Alice and Bob first ran, ran an authenticated key exchange uh, protocol in which they establish a shared key which is authenticated, meaning they know that key. Alice knows that that key is shared only with Bob, and Bob knows that that key is shared only with Alice. After that, so they establish this key K. After that, they protect their communication using this shared key using classic asymmetric cryptography. So, and this is usually referred to as a secure communication session that follows your authenticated key exchange. As we said at the beginning, the part of the, of the session, which is uh, protected using a shared key is deniable, right? Because if Bob and Alice both know the key, then Bob can convince that Alice said anything during this part. But there is this if it requires the judge to believe that Alice and Bob really know the key, both of them. This basically requires that we make a notion of deniability for this first part of the session. So we need to, in order to claim that the second part of the session is deniable, we need to make sure that Bob cannot convince the judge that Alice is the only person who knows this shared key, and that is a property of the authenticated key exchange that came before the communication session. So you need to define and prove that the authenticated key exchange is also deniable. And this is part of my old 2006 paper. We exactly define what a deniable authenticated key exchange is. And we did that again by assuming the existence of a simulator that without knowing Alice's secret key is able to create an indistinguishable transcript from the real uh, authenticated key exchange protocol. And we make sure that the session key K is part of what, of this view of this transcript that you need to make sure is indistinguishable between the real protocol and the authenticated protocol. And the reason we include the key K in the view is that you really want to have this property that later Bob cannot claim, look, yeah, the, the entire transcript I could produce myself, but the key itself, I couldn't produce it myself. Alice really produced it, okay? So let me say formally, 
So a deniable AKE is an authenticated key exchange protocol, which is deniable for Alice, but you can also make a symmetric definition for Bob. If there exists a simulator that runs on input only Alice's public key, but not our secret key, the simulator interacts with Bob, and Bob could possibly be malicious, deviate from the uh, correct instructions of the protocol. This must be a real world simulator, as it, uh, Raphael Pass defined it, um, a deniable simulator. And this deniable simulator should create a view that is indistinguishable from the real view, and this view must include the session key. And that guarantees that the communication session that comes later is deniable, no matter how you key, how you use the key that you establish in the first part. Turns out that this notion of deniability in key exchange protocols had been somehow floating around uh, in, when people were designing key exchange protocols. Um, Hugo sh was showing me how there was lots and lots of conversations in the IATF working groups that uh, were uh, the internet key exchange protocols were discussed that you somehow wanted some notion of deniability. And this informal discussions went on without a real formal definition of what that meant. Um, academically, I can trace one of the first attempts to formalize and design deniable AQ to the influential off-the-record protocol by Borisov and al., and al that came out in 2004. And actually, that's what I trace my involvement to this, because my involvement to this was that um, the, the first version of the OTR protocol, Ugo, Mario, and I uh, found an attack, and, and that's actually where we um, decided that you really needed to define and formalize what it meant. And then ability has moved to become a primary design consideration in the new generation of IT protocols, and it's claimed and used in many of the current messaging applications that we all use this day, such as Signal and Telegram. There are all this uh, claim that if you talk on Signal or you talk on Telegram, your conversation is off the record. So that's moved into the mainstream, into the consciousness of the users, that it's an important property that you need. So let me talk a little bit about one of the old uh, examples of key exchange that actually turns out to be deniable. Um, this is a protocol designed by Hugo Krawczyk uh, in, in 96. So a pretty old and established protocol. It's called Scheme. And Scheme is basically a basic Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol, which is then authenticated with that so this is a basic Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. I change X and Y, we compute G to the XY, that's our share value. But we're not, we're, we haven't authenticated yet. Bob doesn't know he's talking to Alice, Alice doesn't know that he's talking to Bob. So what we are introduced is long-term public keys that are encryption keys. And then we use this encryption-based deniable authenticator that I just uh, described before. Alice sends a nonce to Bob. Bob sends a nonce to Alice. And now the key is somehow a function, here it is, think of it as a hash of the nonces and the Diffie-Hellman key of the original uh, Diffie-Hellman protocol. And now you have um, authentication because only Alice and Bob know A and B. You have perfect forward secrecy because you have a fresh Diffie-Hellman key exchange during during this uh, protocol. And so this is, um, you know, this seems to be, and this seems to be deniable because um, you can see how Bob, uh, I'll show you there in a minute, you can see how Bob can simulate it. Here's the simulation. Here, um, the simulator doesn't know the secret key of Alice, but he can definitely create the first message coming out of Alice. Bob answers with this message. And now if we assume plain text awareness, the only thing that the simulator is missing is this value B here. But if we assume plain text awareness, then the simulator will find that value B inside Bob's brain, opens the boxes, gets B, and completes the simulation. So 
there we go. And this again, the formal proof of this thing appear in, uh, in our old paper. That should be 0, 06, not 96. All right, great. So at this point, we seem to be, we have all our pieces. Alice and Bob could run scheme to establish a key. This is a deniable protocol if you assume plain text awareness. And then they can have a communication, a secure communication session using this key. This is deniable because it's a, a, sorry, a symmetric uh, cryptography um, is used to protect this communication and the original key exchange was deniable. All right, we should be done, right? Well, not quite. Signal and 3DH, Signal it utilizes a different AKA uh, authenticated key exchange protocol called 3DH. The goal, and here I'm speculating because I, I'm not sure why they use 3DH, but uh, from looking at the protocol is that the goal was to avoid public key encryption to authenticate. Why? It's potentially more expensive. It creates longer messages. Uh, there's this plain text awareness assumption. And most important, Bob's message, let me go back for a minute. Here's Bob. Bob's message depends on Alice's identity. Uh, which is fine if Bob, both Bob and Alice are alive and they uh, want to communicate, but in uh, Signal, for example, there is an asynchronous mode in which Bob starts the protocol without really not knowing who he's going to communicate with. So Bob is going offline, he leaves, uh, his message on a server and say, if somebody wants to talk to me, uh, have them uh, use this message as they, as if I'm alive. And then when I come back online, I'll get everything from the server. So those are the reasons that Scheme would probably not, was probably not suited to be used in an application like Signal. So if they're not using Scheme, if, that, if they're not using encryption-based authentication, what are they using to authenticate? And is it deniable? And in spite of widely claimed and assumed deniability uh, for this protocol, we went through uh, all the literature and found no formal analysis so far of the deniability properties of Signal and its associated AKE. 3DH. So let me tell you what 3DH is. 3DH stands for Triple Diffie Elman. It's a Diffie Elman key exchange which is authenticated through two other additional Diffie Elman values. Now it works. The long term keys of Alice and Bob are Diffie Elman values A equal G to the A and B equal G to the B. Then Alice and Bob do a basic Diffie Elman. Uh, key exchange in which Alice sends an ephemeral public key x equal g to the x and Bob responds with an ephemeral public key y equal g to the y. And this is great because the transcript is minimal. You, you have no additional values being sent into the transcript. So how do Bob and Alice authenticate each other at this point? Well, they are going to create a key which is the result, the hash of three different Diffie-Elman values. One is the Diffie-Elman of these two values. That will give you freshness and perfect forward secrecy. One is the Diffie-Elman of this value with this value. And this will guarantee Alice that she's really talking to Bob because Bob is the only person who knows little b. And the other one is the Diffie-Elman between this value and this value. And this will guarantee to Bob that is really talking to Alice because only Alice can do uh, uh, the Fjellman with G to the A. For some reason, they did not include uh, the fourth the Fjellman, which is G to the AB. Um, although that would actually would have given you even an extra uh, level of security in terms of authentication. Um, so here is your protocol, and it seems on its face, intuitively deniable. There is nothing in these two messages 
that ties the transcript to Alice's identity and Bob's identity. Um, two years ago, I was a, at CCS, um, and somebody talking about deniability said, oh, you see, there are no signatures. Of course, it's deniable. And um, referring to a different protocol. And here, the point is, remember our definition of deniability requires you to also simulate the key that results from this protocol. And we're gonna have some trouble figuring out how to simulate that. So let's try to simulate that. So here we have a simulation that will play the role of Alice, does not know little a. Well, there's no problem simulating Alice's message because the simulator can choose an X and send the ephemeral public key the same way in which Alice sends it, then refer, receives Y from Bob. And now this poor simulator, it can definitely compute B to the X and Y to the X because it knows little X, but it cannot compute Y to the A, which is what Alice would have done through knowledge of A, little a. Also, the simulator doesn't know little y. This value right here is g to the ay. Doesn't know little y because that came from Bob. And so the simulator is stuck. It cannot figure out what this value is, okay? And um, there is no box in Bob's brain that can give us a little why. There is no equivalent here of plain text awareness because Bob could, this is just a group element, is not an encryption with some structure, right? So Bob can easily choose why without knowing little why, right? So we cannot make an equivalent notion of plain text awareness that would magically pop little why out of this message. So uh, what are we going to do, right? And turns out that actually, in general, the simulation is impossible. Consider the example in which the key is, is the, the straight group element without the, um, without the hash function in front. If that's the case, then this, this protocol is not simulatable at all because Bob could choose a Y for which he probably doesn't know the desk will log. For example, take today in his paper, hash it into the group. There's no chance for Bob to know the desk will log of the result of that computation. Bob itself cannot compute G to the AY. So that seems to be hopeful because if Bob cannot compute G to the AY, then it may not be able to convince the judge that this value is correct. But if this value is actually recognizable as correct, Bob will be able to convince the judge. In technical terms, this means that we have to be in a group where the computational Diffie-Hellman is hard because Bob can show the judge, look, I don't know little y, and I have no way of computing this. But this is really the correct value. Be, and you can tell because the decision of the film is easy. You can tell that this is really G to the AY if I show you capital Y and capital A. Therefore, this value can only come from, from Alice, okay? And we know groups where this is the case. So if we were to run this protocol on one of these groups, then simulation is impossible. So what is the problem? The problem, first of all, is that the, I remove, oh, by the way, let me tell you one thing. This removing the sash is not just a theoretical exercise. There is another protocol called MQV that has a very similar structure where the key in the original definition of the protocol was defined without being hashed. And so our impossibility result applies directly to MQV when ran on a gap development group. So what is the problem? The problem is that even if you put the hash and even if you assume the DDH to be hard, we're still stuck. And this, I have no time to get into this, into the talk, 
but we're still stuck in completing the simulation because why is adversarially chosen is adversarially sample and we need to rule out a malicious sampling that chooses a y such this value is hard to compute but it's easy to detect as correct and even if you assume the random oracle and even if you assume the dh uh, this is not enough to complete the simulation the DDH doesn't help you because Y is adversarially simple, and modeling age as a random oracle doesn't help you either because we have no idea of where to find uh, this query um, that uh, the adversary may not even do actually. So, okay, so yeah, we're still able to create a simulation for 3DH if we make a very strong assumption. And the assumption is the following, that at this point, we assume that inside Bob, there is a, there's a box that tells us either Bob really know this value, okay, then if Bob knows this value, then the simulator is allowed to see it, or Bob doesn't know this value. But if Bob doesn't know this value, then it's okay to simulate the key as a random. Basically, what we're assuming is that um, an equivalent of the DDH or CDH with the random oracle on top will work in the case in which Bob did not choose Y in the correct way. So let me tell you again, we assume the existence of an extractor such that when Bob samples a group element, this extractor knows either Y to the A which means also Bob knows Y to the A, therefore the protocol is deniable because it doesn't mean that he got it from Alice. Or the extractor outputs nothing, but in that case, nobody can distinguish the key from a random value. And therefore, what Bob presents to the judge is meaningless because it could be a random value. This is a very strong assumption and it's been bothering me from the moment we wrote it down because it's very, very close to the definition of the protocol. And it's sort of almost like we're saying the protocol is deniable because it's deniable. You know, it's almost too close to a tautology, but we couldn't really get out of making something weaker. But it is related to the knowledge of exponent assumption in some way, and therefore we can reasonably assume that it holds on the groups that are used by the signal method in the application. All right, I'm getting close to the end. Um, let me tell you a little bit why, if we don't wanna use the strong assumption, what can we do? Um, if you wanna change 3DH with something else, you need to allow this asynchronous version that Signal calls X3DH, in which Bob loads a message on a server when he goes offline and will allow anybody to send him a message while he's offline. Uh, you read Y from the server, run 3DH to compute K, and then encrypt that and get the message with K, leave it with the server for Bob. The important property is that the message from Bob for the authenticated key exchange cannot depend on the identity of the party that he will be communicating with, and you need to use this implicit authentication to, that comes up when you compute. The, the key. And so in particular, as I said before, this rules out something like scheme. We came up with an alternative, which is when Alice and Bob exchange uh, the Fielman keys and they run 3DH to compute the key, they also sign a nonce, a random message, using the femoral keys as as public secret key. Why do we do this? Because, um, by the way, I've had this protocol implemented by a group of undergraduates at City College. Not, su not surprisingly, we're getting twice the cost of the regular 3DH and twice the bandwidth of the regular 3DH. I wanted to know what the cost would, would be. The reason this works is that now we can assume that there is a box that will up Y, and that's the result of this step right here. Bob will not be able to sign anything unless he knows the secret key. Think of Schnorr, right? If you're using Schnorr, 
as with public key y and cyclic key little y, then if you sign, you need to be able to, uh, there's a way to extract the little cyclic key out of, your, um, out of your brain. And so this will allow us to complete the simulation with a much weaker assumption um, than uh, the one that I stated before. However, this requires, as I said, twice the computation and twice the, the bandwidth of the original 3DH, but the messages are, again, independent of the identity of the peers, which allow you to have this asynchronous mode the signal utilizes. All right, I'm done. And I want to, to come out with these conclusions. And this is where the audience uh, of a standard body, if I like to sort of come with some uh, important conclusion and comments off at, of the stock. So first of all, deniable off the record communication is very important. It's crucial if you want to allow truly anonymous interaction. Um, it has important societal implications, whistleblowers, human rights activists, journalists. Um, we need it. It's important and it's something that we have to work on. This is a mature body of research. There is plenty of work on it. We know what formally we have to do. We also know that it's a very delicate and a hard problem uh, because of the way that ability has to work in the real world. And sometimes we have to make strong assumptions. And we know that the stronger the assumption, the least confidence we have that it holds. So we need to keep looking for the weakest and most reasonable assumption. We need to trust, but also verify. We can't just look at a protocol, oh, there is no digital signatures, therefore the protocol is deniable. The intuition, we have known now the intuition in cryptography may not be the best way to look, uh, to proceed. We have to prove formally that things actually hold. And that's particularly true for deniability. Simulation is a tool. Um, when we standardize zero knowledge and simulation, we need to keep in mind what the application is. Deniability simulation is a very different, different animal than zero knowledge simulation. And therefore, it's not enough to say this protocol is simulatable and therefore is deniable if we're thinking in terms of zero knowledge simulation. So we need to keep in mind that when we take simulation and apply it. We need to keep in mind what the application is to make sure that our simulation really gives us what we are aiming for. And finally, protocols chosen for standardization should be totally vetted and formally proven. I was really at a loss uh, because Signal is an impressive piece of work, has been a game changer in the area of internet messaging applications, and yet, uh, we a year pass without a formal analysis of the the feature that it was its most uh, crucial, its biggest claim of fame. Right? You can talk off the record and say no, and yet nobody ever formal analy formally analyzed it. Nobody ever proved it. And as we see, it's not that simple. And if there are other features in Sentinel, for example, related to this asynchronous uh, mode of communication and how you preserve perfect forward secrecy when you have uh, asynchronous communication, that also needed to be uh, formally analyzed. And there is a paper by Yevgeny, um, Joel, and Sandro, uh, Alwan Correcti Dodis, where they talk about these other parts of the signal protocol, and I wanted to make sure I mention it because it not related to deniability, but it is another piece of the formal analysis that we should make before we widely adopt protocols. And uh, at this point, I, I can open it for questions. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much. That was a, an excellent talk. Um, I'm sure we all very, very much appreciated it. Um, I, I would ask, every, well, I would ask everyone to unmute and start clapping, except I sh I'm sure that's a disaster. So let's imagine that that happened and that it actually went really well. But thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, and uh, I, I don't see any, I, I, I think there are a couple questions on the chat right now. I, I think there was, uh, uh, Alessandra just asked a question that I think uh, came up just after the talk was over. So um, I will read that. Uh, it says, if I understand correctly, this uh, covers offline deniability. Uh, is there any interest in online deniability, i.e. the case where Bob and the judge team up from the beginning and Bob forwards to, to the judge all the messages from Alice? So is that a, is that a setting that has also been studied? Hold on, Okay, so I, this is actually a very good question. And I, I, was, I was planning to add a slide and then I forgot. Um, uh, this, is, this only covers offline deniability. Offline deniability uh, is when Alice and Bob talk and then Bob at the end of the conversation goes to the judge. Uh, there is interest in online deniability and actually we also, we already know that Sinnoh is not online deniable. There is a paper by, um, uh, it's, it's my, um, the guy at Waterloo, what's his name? Um, but anyway, you can, if you look about online deniability, he has, he, there's two papers on it. I think they're on print um, that uh, actually show you that the protocol is not online deniable. So there is a way, so online deniable means that the judge is sitting, is, next to Bob, trying to ascertain if Bob is talking to Alice. And this is hopeless if Bob is actually willing to reveal his secret key to the judge, then there is obviously no way. Um, so the notion of online deniability refers to the case in which the judge is part of the communication, but Bob does not know, does not want to reveal to the judge his secret information just to frame Alice. And in there we have hope. Uh, we do know of online deniable uh, protocols, um, but Signal is not one of them. So again, you know, so here we have another example of a wildly adopted protocol, which already know completely fails on the online case. And for the offline case, it's not absolutely uh, clear what the assumption behind entails, right? Uh, great, thank you. Um, the, the next question on the chat was uh, from Dario. Actually, um, uh, Daniel pointed out to me, it's much nicer if uh, people can ask their own questions. So Dario, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, I don't, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's a simple question. It's like this uh, technique of uh, adding the signature to achieve uh, deniability. What's the difference with having a, a proof of knowledge? Uh, of no, it is the same. Is the same, but do you get it's more efficiency perhaps using the signature trick? Or? Uh, I think if you use a signature, um, you have the ability. Um, all right. So you need to, if you're doing things non-interactive in the random oracle model, then you're going to have to rewind the random oracle to extract this Y. So with the signature, I think because it's a nonce and appears as part of the, pro if you're signing something, you can make that something being fresh as part of the protocol, right? So, and then mm -hmm. um, your, your rewinding can somehow be limited as opposed to a basic uh, non-interactive proof of knowledge. I, I'm, I was trying to maintain the two round thing, okay. right? So in that case, the signature gives you a little more control on how the rewinding goes. By the way, if you really want to do a proof in the random oracle model that you can extract why you end up in issues of uh, nesting, rewinding. Mm -hmm. So you need also need to, so either you make an assumption that if you sign push nor non-interactively, you must know why, and there is an extractor that will pop up the secret key, which is again, you know, or if you really want to, and then you need to somehow limit the amount of concurrent um, executions that Bob can make, right? And because 
signal goes through the server, you, in practice, you may be able to do it. Like the server will only open 10 communication sessions for Bob, and then your, your simulation will run in two to the 10. So you, you could do that. Okay. And then, uh, sure, yeah, the reason we start, question, yeah. What? No, no, I have another related question, but uh, finish. Uh, yeah. Can... No, the other question is like whether it's okay, it's enough to uh, use a one time signature in this case. I didn't think of it. It might. I, I did not think of it. Okay, we can think of like that. So yeah, so by the way, Matteo in the talk, in the chat, uh, found uh, the right, the right uh, paper. Uh, and it is Ian Goldberg. The name that I cannot come up was, is Ian Goldberg has been doing a lot of work on the online deniability on coming up. So online deniability was introduced by uh, Shabzi Walshfish in his PhD thesis with um, Yevgeny and Jonathan Katz, and I think there's a poor photo in that paper. <laughs> but um, they have non, not very efficient protocols, and Ian Goldberg has been doing a lot of work in trying to come up with more efficient protocols that are online deniable. Uh, Signal is not one of them. Great. Okay, so that um, I think we maybe have time for um, one or two more questions. So, and it looks like there are two more questions in the or three. So in the there chat. are two. One uh, is so yeah. Thomas. Uh, so Daniel. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, please. Uh, no, 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 go ahead. I, I'm reading. I think there was one so up, I... slightly up further uh, from yeah, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I found it. I find it. Am I correct in understanding that the assumption you have to make for Sina is weaker than the generic model? Uh, that's also a very good question, and we have not looked into that it'd be interesting to to see if the assumption holds or doesn't hold in the generic room model i believe you're right i believe that in the generic room model this would hold and therefore the assumption is weaker but we we haven't looked at it and it's something that we probably should be doing um uh daniel says is there yeah non-transferability of proof is uh um is maybe the most uh, the closest that you can think of. Um, I, I think the, the real the really thing that we need to think about is the difference between what it means uh, to simulate a proof versus what it means to simulate a conversation. So uh, if you simulate a proof, uh, you know you can set up your environment in any way you want. Uh, if you simulate a conversation, you, you're stuck with the environment that you are in. So that I really, it's really where you are like. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and okay, to, and the last question. Um, so first of all, I have to make clear that anything I spoke in the stock relates to um, linking and identifying parties through the electronic through this, the, the cryptography that you use, right? It doesn't talk about traffic analysis. It doesn't talk about metadata, metadata and all of that. That's a whole other uh, kind of worms that you would have to look at. But yeah, but, so you would need to add um, something like Tor on top of it to have additional level of deniability uh, that you know, even if you use Tor, right? If, uh, if you and I communicate using Tor, but we run uh, an authenticated key exchange on top of that, a third party cannot detect that we are talking, but one peer will be able to show that, right? Because it has the transcript in his end that uh, Bob will have a transcript in his end that he talked to Alice, regardless of how that transcript reached him, right? So, um, so you need both. You need the uh, P2P and the mixing. You know, I, I like to think of Tor um, on top of the deniable communication mechanism that you use to communicate with your peer. So one protects you from the third party. One protects you from the malicious peer. 
Great. Okay. Well, I think we've uh, just come to the end. So <clears throat> once again, um, let's have a, a virtual uh, clap. That was really, really, really enjoyed the talk. Um, I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, I think at, at this point, uh, we are going to go uh, to uh, Yao, who will be uh, taking us to the networking session, I believe. So.